When X-Men the Animated Series premiered on the 31st of October 1992, the world stood witness to one of the greatest superhero television shows ever made. From the moment the now iconic Ron Wasserman theme song played for the very first time, comic book fans knew that this series was going to be unlike anything they'd ever seen on the small screen. And today, some 27 years after the show's debut, the 90s X-Men cartoon is still regarded as one of the all-time best comic book television shows, as well as one of the best adaptations of Marvel's beloved mutant team of all time. The show brought the X-Men and their world to life with a level of understanding and love to the source material largely unseen in children's television. It wasn't just a show starring the X-Men, it was the X-Men, as fans of the comics had come to know, almost perfectly translated into animation with their characters, costumes and famous storylines all brought with them. Which makes it all the more fascinating that the 1992 X-Men animated series wasn't actually Marvel's first attempts to bring Charles Xavier's Merry Mutant team to life, and in actuality, the show we eventually got came about as a result of compromises and changes made to a much different, earlier attempt at an animated X-Men TV series. So, in this video, I want to break down the real history of how X-Men the Animated Series came to be, and the almost realised pilot that would have fundamentally changed everything we know about Marvel animation today, and how its downfall and demise eventually paved the way for one of the most seminal, iconic, and beloved animated shows of all time. Although the X-Men animated series that we know and love came about in the early 1990s, the history of Marvel adapting their heroes for animation actually dates back to the 1960s, with the company spotlighting a number of their most popular characters in the Marvel Superhero Show, before greenlighting standalone series for both Spider-Man and the Fantastic Four in 1967. It's almost surprising knowing that Marvel were producing shows featuring their flagship heroes for television from this period onwards, that it took until 1992 for the X-Men to receive their own series. But honestly, it wasn't for lack of trying. You see, while the first wave of Marvel animation came in the late 60s, Marvel Productions, the television and motion picture division of Marvel Entertainment, also had great success in the 1980s, producing adaptations of classic Marvel comics, including Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends, and NBC's The Incredible Hulk. Now, it's worth noting that Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends saw the webhead team up with fellow heroes Iceman and Firestar, two mutants, so the X-Men actually made several cameo appearances throughout the show's three seasons, flaunting a design ripped straight from the pages of Chris Claremont and John Byrne's uncanny X-Men run, and also featuring the bizarre inclusion of a now Australian Wolverine, Want a piece of fruit? voiced by actor Neil Ross. Eventually, after a number of appearances in the Spider-Man series, Marvel began working on a pilot episode for a new X-Men show in the same vein, siphoning off money from the company's short-lived Robocop animated series to put together a first attempt episode at a show that would attempt to bring to life the beloved X-Men of the late 1980s. And eventually, in 1989, this came to fruition in the form of a pilot episode entitled Pride of the X-Men. Pride of the X-Men was a 22-minute pilot episode developed by Marvel and New World Television, and brought to life by Toei Animation, the Japanese firm behind such shows as Dragon Ball Z, Sally the Witch, and Sailor Moon. With the script heavily inspired by issues of Chris Claremont's Uncanny X-Men series, being written by future X-Men and Spider-Man the Animated Series scribe, Larry Parr. The pilot, narrated by X-Men co-creator Stan Lee, introduces us to a team consisting of Cyclops, Storm, Colossus, Nightcrawler, Dazzler, Australian Wolverine, Don't worry about us, Dingo! I'll make sure we can! and newcomer Kitty Pride, who, under the leadership of Professor Charles Xavier, attempt to save the world from Magneto and his brotherhood of mutant terrorists. The episode, not only introducing us to no less than 14 major mutant characters, also showcased famous X-Men landmarks, such as the X-Mansion, which included Cerebro and the Danger Room, and the Brotherhood's base of operations, Asteroid M. The overall plot of this pilot is campy to say the least, 
as Magneto attempts to redirect a comet onto a collision course with Earth, blocking out the sun for years and plunging the planet into an ice age. The climax of the pilot seats the X-Men face off against the Brotherhood on Asteroid M, as the comet travels closer and closer to Earth. In the end though, the X-Men defeat the villains, and Kitty Pride uses Magneto's power to redirect the comet to instead crash into Asteroid M, with the heroes valiantly flying away aboard the Blackbird as the comet collides with the villain's base. For her heroics, Kitty begins her initiation as a member of the X-Men, though is warned by Australian Wolverine, So the kid got lucky that don't make her an X-Men. Not yet. While the pilot was certainly a little rough around the edges, the potential for this to become a successful X-Men series was there. So I guess the big question is what happened? Well, not long after the pilot was developed in 1989, Marvel ran into some financial difficulties, eventually leading to their parent company New World Entertainment selling Marvel to McAndrews and Forbes, a holding company owned by businessman Ron Perlman. Now, this change in ownership meant the production on Marvel's various animated shows were halted, with the new owners ultimately deciding to ditch the likes of their promising X-Men series in favour of more child-orientated shows, notably Jim Henson's Muppet Babies. With Pride now dead, the likelihood of an X-Men series ever being made seemed bleak. That is, until the former president of Marvel Productions, Margaret Loesch, took over as the head of Fox Kids in 1990, buying the X-Men TV rights and actively putting together a new pilot episode. Saban Entertainment was contracted to produce the show, who worked alongside Graz Entertainment to develop scripts, designs, and storyboards, with this new pilot being animated by South Korean studio, Acom. By September 1992, a two-part X-Men pilot entitled Night of the Sentinels was ready to air on Fox Kids, and this revised attempt at bringing the X-Men to life was not only met with huge acclaim and praise, but was eventually picked up by Fox, becoming X-Men The Animated Series. In a lot of ways, the pilot episodes of X-Men The Animated Series weren't too far removed from what Pride had attempted three years prior. Although the visual influence had moved on from John Byrne's late 80s X-Men to that of Jim Lee's new version of the team that debuted in 1991, a lot of the core traits of Pride were carried over into the new series. In fact, structurally, this pilot was very similar to the story being told in Pride, only with Jubilee being used as the audience's gateway character to the team, instead of Kitty Pride. Though it should be noted that overall, X-Men the Animated Series was tonally a much darker show than the somewhat campy Pride, attempting to target a slightly older demographic, with the show tackling a lot of the heavy themes prominent throughout Claremont's time as the writer of the X-Men comic and also deciding to once again make Wolverine Canadian. You don't need me to tell you though, that X-Men the Animated Series went on to become a huge success, spanning five seasons and maintaining a cult following to this day. But I do find it fascinating to look back at Marvel's first attempt to bring these characters to life and think about what could have been if things had gone slightly differently. While overall, I do think the 1992 series that we got was a much stronger show overall, with a more adult-friendly concept that allowed it to tell more deeper and complex stories, this isn't to say that the pride of the X-Men pilot was bad, because honestly, it wasn't. Sure, it was campy, a little overstuffed, and Australian Wolverine is certainly a choice, but I genuinely think there's also a lot of potential and promise lodged within every frame of this 22 minute episode. And in many ways, it's almost comforting to know that while it may not have been the incredible show that came as a result of its downfall, the X-Men seemed to always be destined to have a show that understood and loved the very things that made their heroes unique, and translated that into the world of animation in a way that made audiences understand and love the X-Men as well. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure to leave a like on the video and leave a comment down below as well. Let me know your thoughts on Pride of the X-Men, the cancelled X-Men TV pilot. Would you like to have seen the show? Or are you glad that we got the X-Men cartoon that we ultimately got? If you're new to Owen Likes Comics, please consider hitting the subscribe button and the little notify bell next to it so you never miss another video. 
and if you enjoyed this one there should be some other videos on screen right now that you might also enjoy. If you want some more of me you can follow me on Twitter just at Owen Likes Comics and if you want to help support the channel there are links in the description to both my Patreon and my Ko-fi. But that's all for this video, thank you all for watching I'll see you all next time. So until then, take care and keep reading.